Social media has popularized trading zones, especially Zone 2. But what if I told you that Zone 2 is completely made up? Now, if that wasn't bad enough, it gets even worse because there are multiple interpretations of the same zone model. And on top of that, some people decided to create the 6 and 7 zone trading model, which is just simply confusing and highly inaccurate. But there is one trading zone model that is accurate and highly effective. And today we're going to talk about it. As always, my name is Max. I am a medical doctor and endurance athlete. And now let's get into one of my favorite topics trading zones. Okay, so the truth is there are a lot of different trading zones. The most popular trading zone out there is the five zone model. And there are two interpretations of that. The first interpretation is based on maximum heart rate. So you calculate your zones based on a percentage of your max heart rate. And the second five zone model is based on anaerobic threshold. And so the zones are calculated based on a percentage from your anaerobic threshold. But here is the issue with both of these models. There is no clear definition between zone one and zone two, and there is no clear definition between zone 4 and zone 5. What makes this more confusing is that both of these are 5 zones, yet anaerobic threshold, which is very important in endurance sports, is defined as the upper border of zone 4 or the upper border of zone 3 based on these two models. As you can see, there is no one clear system. So when someone refers to threshold trading, one is going to mean zone 3, the other one is going to mean zone 4, it is very unclear based on the 5 zone model what we are talking about. This is why the 5 zone model leads to a lot of misunderstanding and misinterpretation whenever we talk about exercise physiology. And two training zones that are even worse than this are the 6 and 7 zone training models. The reason why these are worse is because they incorporate zone 6 or zone 6 and zone 7 and these are meant to represent anaerobic activity. Now combining aerobic and anaerobic activity is even more confusing because they are two opposites of the spectrum and all of these models lead only to confusion and misunderstanding because these zones cannot be accurately determined. So what I recommend is you forget about the 7 zone model, you forget about the 6 zone model, and you do not use both of the 5 zone models. Why? Because there is a much better system, which I'm going to explain shortly. And the next thing I want to mention, and this ties back to the 6 and 7 zone model, is that whenever we talk about training zones, we are referring to aerobic exercise. This is extremely important. Of course, there is going to be anaerobic contribution to aerobic exercise. That is obvious. Right now, I'm just sitting. I'm producing lactate. So there is always an anaerobic contribution that does not mean that right now I'm primarily relying on anaerobic energy production. And so whenever I say training zone, I am referring to categorizing aerobic exercise. This needs to be very clear. For anaerobic exercise, there is a completely different system, has nothing to do with training zones. And so let's talk about the training zones that actually work and we can actually determine. These can also be referred to as exercise intensity domains. And there are only three, zone one, zone two, and zone three, that's it. These three zones are an expression of aerobic energetic production. And so what we need to do now is clearly define what the difference is between these three zones. And this is where we need to talk about lactate because lactate is the thing that helps us differentiate all these training zones and so we can clearly see that we have two very important parameters lt1 and lt2 this simply is referring to lactate term point one and lactate term point two now as you can see you have very many different ways of calling essentially the same thing we have anaerobic threshold, we have the lactate turn point, onset of blood lactate accumulation. These are all things that are meant to represent LT2. And this is very important because you might be watching other videos and they will refer to LT2 as anaerobic threshold. And I just want you to understand that all these things are meant to represent the same thing. And so the next logical question to ask is how do we accurately determine LT1 and LT2? And by the way, if you like the information that I provide, I highly recommend you check out my Telegram group because there I post summaries of all my videos. I post the most important pictures, graphs, and tables. Not only that, but I share key insights into my own life, into my own training, because the information that I provide on this channel isn't just theoretical knowledge. It's information that I apply on a daily basis in my own personal life. Keep in mind, it's completely for free. So if you're interested, click the link in my description. And so the way most people measure their LT1 and LT2 is very simple. They go into a sports laboratory, usually they do a VO2max test, and during that test, they take lactate. The main point is, let's take running as an example. You start at a very slow pace and you increase the pace every three minutes. And after those three minutes, you take your blood lactate value. And this happens essentially until you reach exhaustion. But here is the problem. If you would show this graph, 
to 10 exercise physiologists, you would have 10 different interpretations of where LT1 and LT2 is. And so even though this test is quick and simple, it is not very accurate. And so the lab that you go to will use any one of these metrics to determine your LT1 and LT2. The issue is that most labs go the lazy way. They just measure lactate at 2.0 and lactate at 4.0. And they say, okay, this is where your LT1 is and LT2. And this is what you commonly hear on the internet. Your LT1 is at 2 millimoles per liter and your LT2 lies at 4 millimoles per liter. However, there is a major issue with such a simplistic approach. And the issue is, once again, it is inaccurate. So the question is, what do you do? Well, let me show you what I do. Instead of going to a lab and doing all of this, because once again, I have been to a lot of laboratories and the result that I personally got and the experience that I have working with a lot of labs, it is truly horrible because the results that I've gotten personally from my view to max and lactate tests are so inaccurate, it is truly hard to believe. And so the test that I use for myself and both my athletes that I coach is a MLSS test. Now this stands for maximum lactate steady state. Let's look at what we do during an MLSS test. It's the same principles. You get on a treadmill, you have a specific speed, but instead of increasing that speed every three minutes, you sustain it for 30 minutes. And so these are my personal results from a couple of weeks ago. This was an MLSS test that I did during three days. This is of course the drawback of such a test. It is just that it takes a very long time to do. And so what we do with this test, we pick a speed at which you can run at for 30 minutes. We start with usually slower paces and then up the pace. The idea is to take lactate every five minutes but I do it every 10 minutes and it still works perfectly well. The only caveat, you need to take lactate without contamination. And so the idea of this test is to give you an actual picture over a 30 minute time period, what happens to your lactate values. And as you can see, during 10.5 kilometers per hour and 11.5 kilometers per hour, I only increase my speed one kilometer per hour for every single step. What we see in zone one is that my lactate levels after 30 minutes of running are way lower than even my baseline lactate values. And so this gives me a very good indication of where my LT1 is, because as soon as I increase my speed by just, once again, it's only one kilometers per hour, my lactate levels behave very differently. Instead of being below two millimoles, being like 1.5, 1.6, they jump to around 3.3. However, during the 20 minute mark, they go a little bit down and then they come back up. Now, as we can see, even though there's only a one kilometer per hour increase here, lactate behaves very differently. There is a huge jump in blood lactate values. However, 12.5 kilometers per hour is not very comfortable to run at for 30 minutes, but after looking at these results, I knew I had to come back a third time and increase the speed once again by one kilometers per hour. And here, once again, we have a quite drastic jump in blood lactate values. And this is the point of an MLSS test, because what we do here is we compare the blood lactate value at 10 minutes and 30 minutes. And if the blood lactate value did not change for more than one millimole per liter, this means that you are still at threshold, which means that this is your maximum lactate steady state concentration. And as you can see, my lactate at 10 minutes was 4.7 and my maximum lactate was 5.4. This means that 13.5 kilometers per hour is the upper end of my zone two. And so as you can see, my heart rate at LT2 is 186 beats per minute and it's 172 for LT1. This is actually very high. And so based on these lactate values, we have an extremely accurate depiction of my training zones because we can clearly see zone one, we can clearly see zone two, and then everything above zone two is metabolically unsustainable. That is the main point. This is where we get into zone three. So as you can see, this is a very accurate test and it gives you a great picture of your training zones. And this is something that we can actually measure and interpret. There is one small thing that I want to mention. We not only can look at lactate, but we can also look at your view to max. And the point is that if you run at MLSS, your oxygen levels remain stable. However, even if you have an increase in more than one millimole per liter during an MLSS test, if we were to measure oxygen consumption, it can still be steady. So if you want to be extremely accurate, you can use both lactate and view to max testing in order to determine that steady state. Because once again, the whole point of zone two is that your oxygen consumption remains stable. You are in a metabolically stable state. And one other word we use to describe 
describe, the upper end of zone 2 is actually critical speed, which is actually a very accurate way to determine your upper end of zone 2 and can be assessed without a lactate meter or a fancy VO2 mask. And if you're actually interested in how to calculate your critical speed, just keep watching my videos because I will of course make a video on that topic. And so as you can see, if we exercise beyond our zone 2, we will achieve VO2 max because zone three is metabolically unstable. There are no stable levels of blood lactate or oxygen consumption. And this is one of the most important differentiators when it comes to your training zones. Correctly understanding where your upper limit of zone two is because this is going to define metabolically stable and metabolically unstable exercise intensities. And so having looked at all of this, we can clearly see that we have three intensity domains. We have the easy to moderate intensity domain. We have the heavy domain and severe. And the reason why we have these three zones is because the easy to moderate zone is the zone where your fat max lies. Fat max is the maximal capability to oxidize fatty acids. Then we have the threshold zone, which is very popular on the internet, yet very misunderstood. And then the severe zone, as we talked about, is your VO to max zone. And so whenever we talk about training zones, these are the one and only training zones. We have zone one, with the main point being your fat max. Then we have LT1. This is the separate between zone one and zone two. Zone two is your threshold zone. And then we have zone three. And what separates zone two from zone three is your maximum metabolic steady state. And zone three, of course, is your view to max zone. And one thing that I want to mention from my previous video on muscle fiber types is that, as you know, we have three types of muscle fibers. And whenever you exercise in zone one, you will primarily be using type one fibers. And whenever we get to zone two, this is where we start to recruit our type two A muscle fibers. And zone three is primarily type 2A fibers. Type 2X fibers can play a contribution in zone 3. However, these are more focused on power and anaerobic work. So even though they might contribute to exercise, they are not going to do that significantly. And the reason why I'm telling you all that is because now what we're going to do is we're going to isolate each zone, look at it separately and discuss in detail what that zone represents, how to train it and how to actually structure your training, i.e. periodization. But these are training zones for a very well-developed athlete. If you are a person that runs a marathon in around 4 hours and 15 minutes, then this is what your training zone is going to look like. As you can see, your fat max isn't even in zone 1. And so my goal with the playlist of building elite endurance is to help you go from training zones that look like this to training zones that look like this. Now, as always, I hope you learned something new and valuable. And if so, I hope to see you in my next video.